So this is really the last, the last panel of the day, second last panel of the day. We're going to have presentations um, that will come after this. And this is a panel on the circular economy. Now, the reason why we decided to put this panel in is on one of Jochen's slides, you saw the circular economy as being one of the solutions to think about in terms of trying to solve the, the climate uh, crisis. So we decided to bring in three experts in the area who are really living and working and doing business in the circular economy. Now, just for clarity, a lot of people seem to think that the circular economy is about recycling. It is not about recycling. The circular economy is really about a redesign on the way we live. The way we currently live is very linear. We take, we make, and we waste. So the circular economy is about really shifting that around, completely having a complete paradigm shift, and creating innovative business processes to stop us doing exactly that. Now, as we've heard the whole day, it's possible to do good and to do well. And UNEP has actually done some research and found that if we shifted the way we look at the circular economy, the global economy could expand by almost $2 trillion. So there's a real business imperative in terms of getting this right. So on my panel today, I'm going to introduce our guests. We have, first and foremost, Alice Grindhammer. Alice is the founder and CEO of Circular. It's pronounced Circular, but it really is a short form of that. She is based here in Hip Neukölln in Berlin. And Circular is basically a physical hub of companies that are focused on the circular economy. Welcome. We also have Ditte here. Ditte is the managing director for TCW. And she's also one of the co-authors of a book called The Change Makers, which if you haven't read that book, you really should get your hands on it. I'm promoting it for you, Ditte. And Thank you. What Ditte also brings to this panel is the ability to talk about business models, specific business models that could really work in a circular economy context. Welcome, Ditte. And last but not least, our only male on the panel, which is great, is <laughs> <laughs> very rare to get this opportunity where the man is the um, minority. Andrew is a great representative of his, his, his species, if you like, and he is, the, he is a partner at Singularity Capital. What I like about Singularity Capital is, Secularity Capital, sorry, is that it's a private equity fund that is focused on investing in businesses that are in the circular economy. So Andrew spends his day looking for businesses, trying to make them scale, and investing directly in them. And he's been doing that for the last three years. So welcome, everyone. Thank you. So I'd like to start off with, um, with Ditte first, more on the, innovation, on the innovative business models. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about which business models you're seeing working in the circular economy and how they're able to scale in order to make the impact that they need to make. So I think first off, the thing about circular economy is that it's a tool, not a goal in itself. So it's a tool to really make business and climate prerequisites by decoupling growth from emissions use and, and virgin resources. So in that sense, right now I see that there's short-term business models and long-term business models. And the short-term business models is really focusing on how do we design the world of tomorrow with the waste of today. So really utilize waste as is almost abundant resource that we have today. And then the other part of it being how do we design a world without waste so, or in the long term. So in the short term, there's a lot of opportunity within the um, waste recovery, so resource recovery and really supplying through um, waste. So essentially, rather you're taking a new material in, so you're uh, procuring a non-virgin resource or you're the one who's collecting that and actually turning it into a new product. There's a lot of opportunity there short term long term looking towards product as a service is really for me the key business model of really changing things around and making sure that you from an incentives perspective is really aligned in terms of 
business and climate being prerequisites. So, so give us an example, product as a service, give us an example of a business in mm-hmm. Europe that you see has done that really, really well and has had excellent impact in that area. Yeah, I think we're still, um, the way we see it right now, where I see it is that you have either startups that have it at the core, or you have uh, this sort of larger multinational focus where they have it as a small part of the business. The example that's often used, when, and for good reason, is Philips with their Lightning as a service, because it's a it's a big company that's really managed to turn that incentive around. And we all know uh, the annoyance of, of having to change your light bulbs and the fact that from an innovation perspective, literally when innovation and technology should by all means mean that light bulbs can last longer because there hasn't been an, a business incentive to do so. Light bulbs actually can last shorter than, than they used to. So really, that's a great example of how we once again can make sure that um, we can utilize business as, as a source for good in terms of their innovation power because they're incentivized to do so. The longer they last, the better the business it is for Philips. Okay, and just a last question. How about startups in this space mm-hmm. that you think are notable in terms of what they're doing? Because we hear about very many startups in this space every time, and, and I'm going to turn to Andrew to talk about that. Could you name any in Germany that you think are, are notable? I don't know that many in Germany, but I think I know Andrew knows one very well, Grover, um, which is quite somewhat of a, of a product-as-a-service model with electronics being leased rather than, than owned. So, so it's definitely part of the solution. I think the next step for a company like Grover is when do you start actually from the production side of things. So it's a great thing with, with Grover enabling the platform, but really when you start also from the whoever is producing that electronics, whoever is producing and really designing for circularity at the start. Okay, so I'll, I'll jump to you then. I, I hope you've invested in Grover, have you? Yes, we have, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, so just to give a bit more details, uh, Grover is a, uh, a, a German business based here in Berlin that offers consumers the ability to rent consumer electronics uh, for um, uh, flexible uh, terms. So you, you uh, as a consumer, you can go into a media mart store or go onto the Grover website, and you can choose to rent a, a phone, a drone, a laptop, tablet, etc., for um, a minimum of a month. But you know, y- you can keep it for as long as you want. And then when you finish using it, you return it to Grover. They refurbish it uh, and then <coughs> rent it out to another user. So they are um, over a life of an asset. They're getting three or four use cycles, uh, and then they are refurbishing it in between times. So they're extending the asset life. And then in the end, when it um, leaves their uh, balance sheet, they sell it uh, into the secondary market. So uh, you're extending the useful life of, a, of an asset, making sure it's getting uh, many uh, use cycles. Okay, and, oh. and just, just, sorry, just to pick that up, on the recycling side, what impact have you seen so far since your investment, just in real numbers? What has it resulted in? Uh, well, the bit we invested July last year, and the business has tripled in size. Uh, the customer base has um, not quite tripled in size. Not the customer base hasn't tripled in size, but the assets that they have uh, on their balance sheet have tripled. They've got uh, much uh, much larger customer wallet wallets, um, and uh, the business has just signed a term sheet for a 50 million debt facility to allow them to buy and hold these assets. So there's been a very significant uh, demand, or they're, they're, they are, they're turning away 50% of the customers that they receive bec- just because they, uh, there's so much demand for, the, for their service in, in Germany. Okay, and they're now doing it to, um, uh, for businesses as well, not just uh, consumers. And they're also, you know, to, to Dita's point, they're also working with corporates. Uh, so they're working in Germany with Chibo uh, to say, look, if you want to sell coffee as a service, um, we'll, we'll uh, manage the customer relationship. You continue to own the uh, Chibo, you continue to own the machines, uh, and you supply the machines and the coffee capsules to your consumers. Okay, that's great. That's really handy. Now, ju- just moving away from this particular startup, 
you know, talk to us about what else you have in your portfolio and what your criteria is. Because you know, the impact that you just mentioned on Gruber is really financial. It's not social and environmental. So, so talk to us about your sourcing process and how you really delve into those impact numbers before you make an investment decision. Sure. So what's absolutely key to us, and we're, uh, we're solely focused on investing in the circular economy, and um, as Dita mentioned, it's, uh, it's a framework for decoupling growth from resource constraints. Uh, so by the very nature, if you invest in a circular economy business, you are inextricably linking financial performance with environmental and social impact. And so that's very much key to our investment decision making and due diligence process, is understanding what are the links between the company's financial performance and their, uh, and their environmental and social impact. So to give you another example, uh, well, just to, to talk about Grover for, for, for uh, uh, a little bit longer, so their, their environmental uh, impact is decoupling growth or users in, in uh, consumer electronics from virgin production of, un of consumer electronics. So this year they have an uh, ambition to uh, or target uh, to remove 10,000, or the need to produce 10,000 consumer electronics units uh, from the market just by uh, increasing utilization and getting multiple use cycles from their, uh, you know, through their user base. So that, that uh, target is, is linked directly to their f financial performance and their uh, new customer onboarding. So that, that's, that's a linkage. But to come back to your point and give you an example from another portfolio company, we invested in a company called Winnow Solutions, and that has a, a technology and software for designing out food waste in commercial catering facilities. Um, so it has a set of scales that go under the food bin, and it has a camera and a tablet that sit on top. And so every time food is added to the bin, the scales recognize the weight change, the camera recognizes what sort of food it is, and that gets sent to the cloud. There's an algorithm that runs uh, and spits out a report for the chef at the end of the day showing how much food waste has been saved, or how much food waste has been thrown away, what type of food it is, etc. And over the uh, course of a few weeks, the, the chef or the kitchen manager is able to reduce the food waste by 50%. And that has an impact of uh, reducing their cost of sales by 6%. Uh, and that falls directly to their bottom line, doubles the operating profit of a kitchen, typically. Uh, so the payback for a kitchen is very significant. And last year, they saved the equivalent of 24 million meals worth of food uh, uh, just by uh, their customers using their technology in their kitchens, and it's uh, installed in over a thousand kitchens worldwide in hotels and cruise liners and half the IKEAs globally. So that's a really good example of where, for the customer, the, the economics are great, uh, the sustainability is great, and the, the linkage between environmental impact and, and financial performance is inextricable. Now, now ju just another question, just to sort of expand on your model, you know, obviously as, as, as a partner at Secularity, you're really looking for social and environmental impact. So how are you incentivized as a partner to look for companies that are going to bring that through rather than financial? Because at the end of the day, you, you need to be compensated and incentivized to do that as a partner. So, so talk us through if you have a different model for incentivization from a typical, say, private equity or VC fund that doesn't have a social or environmental um, imperative. So we, we have a very standard incentivization package that you would find across in the vast majority of private equity firms. We were raising the fund in 2016, 2017 when uh, impact measurement was at its you know, um, early days. There wasn't a defined metric to do it. Um, and the market was telling us that you're a new team with a new thesis. Uh, we don't want any other confusing new things in the structure. So everything else plain vanilla. So we, um, we, uh, we don't actually have anything in our fund documentation that links environmental and social performance to our own incentivization. But the very nature of the circular economy delivers both uh, environmental and social impact, as I used the examples in our portfolio. Um, but we do uh, embed the impact reporting with all of our portfolio companies. Uh, we have external assurance uh, on our reporting, so the methodology and, and the data that we use is uh, 
is tested and approved. Yeah, but I, I think in the spirit of, of doing something different from today, you know, I would say there's a lot of LPs, limited partners, who will not invest in a fund which doesn't have, you know, you as a fund manager, you're, you know, there needs to be clear incentivization for you to look for companies that are going to bring social and environmental impact. So maybe it's something to take back to the office. Yeah, I, but, don't, I, I fully agree. And I think that's what we've heard um, earlier today is that the impact and social um, responsibility or social and responsible investing community has moved on and tripled, doubled in size um, over the last two or three years. And when we set out to raise a fund, it was a very different environment. Um, and, you know, if we were raising another fund, I'm sure the dialogue on that would be much more open. Can I, can I just yep, please. comment from, from the investor side? I think actually a lot of what I like about circularity capital is that the goal of that fund is to prove that you don't, they, if you have to choose between either we make the environmental impact or we make the financial impact, then it's not the right investments in the fund because the entire focus, and if you look at the sort of the, the parameter of which you know, like your, your pipeline is, it's the business models there are all aligned with the circular economy in the sense that you know, if, if, if Willow, Willow grows, it's good for the business, but it's also good for the environment. And as soon as it, that would no longer be the case, we have a much bigger problem. So I think that's also why it is the way it is. Absolutely. You have a big defender here, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> um, having been in this sector, though, I do think incentivization of, of fund managers is a really key thing. It just directs yeah. the mind. Alice. So, um, as I said, Alice is, um, is in the hip area of Nukun. You're running um, this impact hub, if you like. Talk to us about your model and how you see that making a difference um, mm -hmm. in terms of the, you know, the negative effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the hip and non-hip, you're very much welcome to come and visit us uh, in Neukölln. Um, so I think the circular economy, what's so powerful about it is that it's actually very closely linked to common sense. It's not that revolutionary in essence. It's if we uh, make business decisions, let's not just think in money, but let's also start thinking in uh, resources. Let's start thinking in waste and let's start thinking in CO2 emissions. And this is a challenge I'm very convinced that we're actually up uh, to facing today. And like the World Economic Forum said that it's one of the biggest risks to business. As we heard here multiple times, it's actually also a massive opportunity and a new market uh, that is emerging. And at the same time that we have kind of 10 years now to actually develop models that are viable and sustainable within uh, the circular economy. And that's exactly what we as uh, Circular want to contribute to. Um, so we uh, develop spaces essentially as hubs for this new and emerging business community. Uh, for entrepreneurs that uh, develop circular uh, business models in the different uh, fields, so if it's in food or in construction or in textile and fashion in different areas. Um, and we also include the big corporates because I think they're just as much part of this change that we need uh, and literally build the bridge between the two because on the one hand we want these big industries to change and at the same time we need uh, more innovative models and so that's what the type of community that we bring together uh, in these hubs. So Alice, ju just to pick that up, so obviously the building and construction industry mm -hmm. in, in Germany is one of the biggest mm -hmm. um, sources of waste. I think 60% of the waste generated in this country is from the building sector. So how are you, are you contributing to that or you're helping to reduce that through your physical building? Yeah, I, I hope that we will contribute to reduce that. As you said, Kanini, the construction sector is really uh, interesting because it uh, creates such a big CO2, uh, negative CO2 uh, footprint. And so we founded a construction cooperative uh, that essentially builds uh, spaces in a circular way as inexpensive as possible for impact-oriented uh, projects. And we're building the two first projects each round about 4,500 square meters here uh, in uh, Hip Neukölln. And uh, there we really went into the nitty and gritty. And I think it's uh, Thomas uh, Edison that said that opportunity is missed by most because it's dressed in a blue suit and it looks like work. And uh, I think everybody in our construction co-op, uh, Simon, my co-founder is here somewhere, maybe you can raise a hand in your blue uh, overall. 
uh, <laughs> can confirm that. So it really meant going into the nitty and gritty. And in terms of construction, it's the planning phase that is really key because in the planning process of a construction, it's where you really lay the foundations for those architectural plans, you then later get the approval after that. It's nearly impossible to shift anything. That was a big learning curve for us at the beginning of this process. We were with our iPhones Googling everything the architects were telling us. In, in, in the meanwhile, we have our own architect team that is assuring that the entire planning process is circular. We did a learning journey where we went to Switzerland, Denmark, and Sweden and visited inspiring uh, projects in order to learn from them because, again, it's not rocket science. Very often there are proven models out there that we can learn from. And then what we did, just as a few tips for everybody here, I think it's applicable applicable to multiple businesses. It's actually mapping the inputs, so the materials you use, mapping the products you use, the technology you use to assure uh, that it's actually circular. It's involving partners in a collaborative way uh, to also assure that it is in the long run. Um, and it's always really picking the circular option, so creating real templates, criteria, uh, to assure that uh, everybody involved knows what are the decision-making criteria. Just, just to stop you there, I want to turn to Andrew now and ask, what, is this an interesting business model to invest in? Well, I mean, they're providing a hub for businesses to develop in. So we, um, uh, we're, we're uh, talking to a number of these hubs all over uh, Europe to you know, find the next uh, gems of uh, businesses to invest in. Mm -hmm. um, but w we, we typically invest in businesses that have already proven their technology, uh, have uh, a good customer base and are, and are scaling. So not necessarily at the startup phase, but more at the kind of growth scale up stage. Um, but you know, we're very excited to hear of the work being done here in Berlin, but also in other uh, geographies ar around Europe. And it's only a good thing for the circular economy in our, in our mind. Excellent. I just wanted to validate that. So, so just, just one last question before I go back around. What, what is your business model, Alice? I mean, we've just talked, um, Andrew's just said this is something that um, they are looking at. How, how do you make your money ultimately? Because you are for profit. Absolutely. Uh, it's a very simple and straightforward business model. At the end of the day, it's similar to space here, like a Soho house. It's a rental model. And, uh, and our growth model is that we will develop multiple spaces like this in Germany and around the world. And uh, in the spaces, we incubate ourselves new business models. So that's the second uh, pillar. That's where the Transform Cooperative is the first model. And we also collaborate with municipalities and the city to develop uh, services and consult them. So our business models are very low risk and proven in the sense that they are very simple in essence. Okay. I, we I just add the circular impact to them. Okay, and, and you picked up a point which I wanted to bring to Dita as well on how the, you're working with partners. And today we had the German Minister of State who was sort of trying to show us what the government is doing. So I think it would be good to hear from you and then now turn to Dita. What is the city government doing mm -hmm. to help with this initiative? Were they a hindrance or were they a supporter? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Dit and I both were actually at the World Circular Fo Economy Forum the last two days, and what was stated, uh, what was one of the three points that we really need to improve on is progressive governance. So we need these frameworks, and the city of Berlin is quite pioneering in that. Actually, we have a zero waste uh, strategy as a city. Uh, at the same time, there are hindrances there, which mainly are often the mindset and risk averseness of uh, politicians, uh, but we see really big progress and a lot of unconventional uh, collaborations that are already starting to happen. So I think fundamentally there is a very solid basis and especially with movements like Friday for Future that is really helping um, to show that there is no way to actually return. It's the question again of how do we make this change, how do we get these progressive governances and how do we get them faster? Okay, Dita. So I think coming from Denmark and the Nordics, we are very blessed with government that has a very um, progressive innovation funding scheme compared to others, which is a huge help for really generating this, generating this type of business, and we see that. So that's a great thing, and I think that's really where we need to focus also from the government level. Um, in terms of really driving the pioneer innovation, that's where it's going to happen. 
um, less so on the procurement side. I think that the procurement side will more be when we have the really tested models and, and these type of things. But, but for the funding of the innovation, that's a great, great opportunity. Um, we have, we see it especially actually in the built environment and where the government is trying to, to push that. And just one in this being a, a green investment summit, I, I firmly believe that the construction sector, if you take one individual sector where there's really a grand opportunity for investing uh, with a circular economy lens, it's the, it's the construction sector. One, it's huge, and the, and the negative impact is huge. Secondly, um, when you look at efficiency within industries, the construction sector is lacking greatly compared to other industries in terms of actually improving productivity. So on the one side, you have that negative uh, environmental impact. On the other side, you simply have an, a, an industry that should be able to have the same level of improving in efficiency that other industries. There's no reason why that shouldn't be the case. So really leveraging those two to, to making this, the construction sector going circular and seeing it as a medium for others. A lot of the innovations that we do is essentially taking waste streams from large multinationals that are currently being burned or, or discarded somewhere else and turning them into building materials because building materials they're, they're at such a large scale, so it's financially viable to turn it into a business case, and then you essentially use, utilize the building stock um, as a fixer for societal well-being. Excellent. And, and just to sort of do another sector analysis, um, the last question. The fashion sector is another one that's responsible for a huge amount of waste globally, and is also one of the least sustainable ones. So, so in terms of your portfolio, Andrew, is there anything there that is textile orientated that you can share? Uh, we don't have anything uh, textile orientated in the portfolio, but we do have a business that provides a platform for optimizing reverse logistics, uh, primarily in online retail. So, you know, the consumer uh, buys th three, gr three garments, uh, tries them all on and sends two back. Uh, and what we're finding in the uh, fashion space is that often uh, these retailers don't want them back uh, because it's costly to get them back. Pro probably more costly than it than than it is to to uh, to stitch together a new one. So they often just to just to keep the customer sweet, they'll ask them just to uh, put a knife through it, take a photo, uh, and dispose of the items so they can get their refund. Um, uh, so Zigzag provides a, a reverse logistics solution to reduce the cost of returns uh, and offer different uh, end end of life scenarios, uh, which are more beneficial than straight to the bin. Fantastic, fantastic. But there are there are lots of interesting uh, opportunities in the whole textile space, and you know, coming back to the point on regulation, there is a sort of sort of positive tide moving in the way of of. Um, uh, sustainability with the plastics ban and, and others and you know, some of the um, regions that do a lot of garment production have zero, zero uh, water discharge uh, rules and regulations in place to avoid contaminated uh, water from the washing and dyeing process and there's some pretty cool technologies uh, in that space that uh, are disrupting the existing processes. Okay, that's great. Now, I know this is a very short session, so I wanted to leave time for questions from the audience. But before we do that, I wanted to turn to Dutte and to Alice and just say, is there anything that you want to say with regards to a myth around uh, the circular economy? Because there's so many things about the circular economy that I read about that are, it turns out not to be really true, you know, around the fact that it's about recycling. It's not, it's about innovation. It's, you know, is there anything you want to sort of clarify in terms of myths that you've come across? I think for me, the main thing really is to say, to remember that it's a tool. It's a tool to really decouple growth and value from emissions and resources. The resources are important because then it's also a tool to de-risking, whether it's your business or your investment, but really that de-risking de part. So in essence, a tool to future-proofing business. And I think that's really where we need to put circularity into context. Oftentimes you find, oh, we circulated this amount of time. And then you go to ask, OK, and what value does that give? And if people can't answer, then, then we have a problem because 
that's where it, re it what it really comes down to the value that the circulation provides not how many time it, it circulates in itself so a tool to future proofing a business that's yeah. excellent alice I think um, I, if there's one takeaway I would like you to take with you that it's uh, really a tool to accelerate a transition to a world without waste with lower CO2 emissions and much more efficient use of resources and therefore really worth to familiarize with deeper. It's also a lot of fun even if it's dressed in a blue working suit and there's a lot of opportunity in that space. Excellent. Can I Yes. No, I'm sorry. Um, I, I just would like to say that it, it is about recycling, but it's also about lots more than just recycling. It's about remanufacture, it's about repair, uh, refurbishment, it's about keeping assets operating for longer, increasing their utilization, uh, and designing uh, products in a circular uh, way. And as a result of all of you know, that it takes into account all of that. There are some really good examples of businesses that have been operating in the circular economy for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. The circular economy is, uh, has come into sort of common parlance in the last five or so years, but the elements of it have been used uh, in the economy for, for decades. Excellent, thank you. So we shouldn't think that this is completely new. It's just the word that is new, it's a new label. Yeah. Great. Can I, now I, can I add one so, small thing? Okay, but I want the, the audience to ask a question, Dita. Just <laughs> one question. We only had 40 minutes. Yes, please. Well, as someone from the electric vehicle space, I don't want to fuel the myth. But we need the microphone. Hey, uh, my name is Robin, and as someone from the electric vehicle space, formerly with Tesla, I do not want to fuel your myth about, uh, you know, recycling. Uh, uh, what you said that it's not part of the circular economy, but I do think it actually makes a big difference. At some point, the product end of life comes, um, and uh, especially with electronic waste and batteries. What is your take? And this is an open question to anyone in this uh, in this panel. What is your take on recycling? And is it part of? Uh, it must be part of something. Yeah. You know, of what you're looking at and of what you're dealing with, right? I think it's it's. I think the point was not that it's not part of circular economy. It's just that it's not the only thing of circular economy. So it goes to the sort of designing the world of tomorrow with the waste of today, but at the same time working. How do we have a world without waste? And I think the best way to approach recycling today is to look not only at quantitative re recycling rates of, you know, like we recycle 80%, but there's nothing about, is it downstream, upstream, and then really look at the quality in which something is recycling. And there you have a lot of this sort of actual value of recycling. And I think that's a key, um, key, key way to look at recycling today. What is it actually recycled for? More than just how much of it is recycled in, in downstream. It's just that someone you have you have to start at a certain point, and now you, you mentioned the building industry at sixty percent of uh, mm -hmm. contributing to it. I, I didn't know that number. That sounds terrible. Um, I mean, we have to start with what we have. So, what you're doing is obviously very good, but there, yeah. So you agree that there's huge opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. It Totally agree. I worked in waste management actually for four years. So I worked in the sector. I worked in municipal solid waste management and re and recycling of plastics, of paper, of toxic materials. Um, and therefore, I think the reframe is to see recycling, to actually look at the material side, which material are we producing with, which material are we using when we design products, how can that material be, uh, is, is it possible to reuse the materials actually that are being used in products or not, and to include this in design processes, and at the same time, Yeah, I, I hope that's not a sign that we have to finish, but just <laughs> keep going, just keep going, Alan. Uh, or the way maybe for that one. Yeah, so many recycling companies today are actually saying we resource the world, and I think that's the way that we have to, have to see the recycling industry of tomorrow. So the recycling industry of tomorrow is actually producing secondary resources for production, not at the end of chain, but actually effectively closing the loop with competence Excellent. and knowledge about materials. That's a great way to close. Okay, so I'm just going to share highlights from the discussion. Andrew's going to go back for his second fund, and he's going to make sure that there's going to be clear incentivization towards um, social and environmental impact. 
And if anyone wants to ask Andrew about a potential investment, anyone in the crowd who's in this sector, please feel free to talk to Andrew. Dittus told us about looking at circularity as a tool for future-proofing business and not just focusing on the quantity recycled, but looking much deeper. And Alice is a great, great steward of what could happen in the construction industry, and we probably need 10, 15 more of the circular hubs that she has started in Neukölln. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.